let's welcome Apostle Joshua Selma. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Please walk up to one or two people and tell them, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Speak over their lives. God bless you. Are you blessing someone? God bless you. In the name of Jesus. Pastor Pojo, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And a big congratulations for 30 years of impact. I think we should celebrate the Lord for his good hand upon Pastor Pojo and the Covenant Nation. I sincerely celebrate with this ministry. And I honor the grace of God upon his life and upon this vision. And um, it's a great honor to be sharing God's word like I'll be doing now. And so thank you so much for you and your dear wife. The Lord bless you and honor you in Jesus' name. Please be seated, everyone. Please be seated, everyone. Um, I have a few things that um, I'll be sharing very briefly. And I'm happy to know that this is a session for pastors and leaders. And so... We'll rub minds together for a few minutes and trust God to give us wisdom. I'm hoping in the name of Jesus that what we'll be hearing in addition to that which we have heard will further equip us and prepare us to be very efficient first in the ministry and then in every endeavor where we have been called. So Father, we pray that you grant us wisdom. We look up to you. We obtain grace. Let your word come with power. Let it transform us. Our hearts are open. We are willing to learn. We are willing to unlearn. We are willing to relearn. Grant us wisdom. Wisdom that works. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Okay, so we'll be discussing a few things. I'll be teaching on the wise or a wise master builder a wise master builder in honor to these 30 years of God's hand upon his servant and this ministry. I just thought to share a few things uh, that will really challenge our hearts and I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10, a wise master builder. Paul is speaking and he said, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. He says, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. But let every man take heed how he builded thereupon. You believe that? Say loud amen. amen. The first thing I want us to know um, in charging our hearts this morning is that as believers, please lend me your attention now, as believers and more importantly ministers of the gospel, the Bible tells us that we are co-laborers with God. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9. We are co-laborers with God. Very simple expression but it's very profound. My life changed when I came into this recognition that a man can be a co-laborer. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, the Bible says we are co-laborers, laborers together with God. Not laborers together with angels, laborers together with God. Isn't this amazing that God can do without us, yet in his wisdom he's left out a space as though limited. It then means that if you have this revelation, you know that you count as far as God's prophetic program is concerned. You count. You are not just a number. You are a co-laborer with God. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus was speaking and he said, I will build my church. And on hearing that statement, you will think 
it was a statement that absolutely meant i don't need any man i can do it alone but now paul is bringing perspective he's saying although um jesus said he would build his church but that pragmatically speaking in that business of building men we are co-laborers with god are we together now it's, it's the first thought that i want to bring this morning that as believers generally when it has to do with kingdom advance we are co-laborers but as ministers of the gospel the bible says we are co-laborers with god number two the second thought that i want to bring this morning is found in ephesians chapter 3 we'll read from verse 14 to 19 profound statement ephesians chapter 3 for this cause i bow my knees to the father of our lord jesus christ reading to 19 next verse please of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named uh-huh that he would grant unto you paul is praying now according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man he says that Christ, pay attention now please, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith and that ye being rooted and grounded in love, uh -huh, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth and the height. Let's read verse 19 together. Ready? One, two, go. And to know the love of Christ which surpasseth all knowledge and that ye might be filled with all the fullness of Paul is praying now. And he reveals to us through his prayer that in as much as we are co-laborers with God, we are not given the liberty to decide how to build men. There is a standard. Are we together now? And that there is already a standard that God desires that all men become a reflection of what Paul calls the fullness of God. Very ambitious statement. Very generous description. How can a man become an expression, a reflection of the fullness of God? Paul is praying now. In as much as we are co-laborers with God, it doesn't give us the liberty to build anyhow or decide or freelance our method. There is a standard. So he goes further to let us know that there is an expectation in the mind of God. He buttresses on that when we get to Ephesians chapter 4. Please pay attention and I'll tie everything together. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 7 now. Reading from 7 to 13. So there is a standard. It says, but unto every one of us is given grace, 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 according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Uh -huh. It says, wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captives and he gave gifts unto men. The word gift there does not just mean talent or spiritual gift. He gave men to men. He gave men as gift to men. Are we together? He gave men to men. Next verse, please. He says, now he that ascended, you know, is the same that descended to the lower parts of the earth. And then verse 10, he says that um, he might feel all things. Let's go to 11 now. We're reading to 13. He gave some, not all, some as gifts to men. He gave some apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Uh -huh. It says for the perfecting. The word perfecting there means the maturing of the saints. Are we together? For the work of the ministry. Do we have it still? All right, beautiful. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If you're a believer, let's shout verse 13 together. Ready? One to go. Till we all come. Uh huh. Uh huh. And unto the measure, there it is again, of the stature of the fullness. That means God is so intentional about raising this bar. There is a kind of believer he seeks to see. There is a kind of believer who can serve his purposes 
to his satisfaction. And the Bible begins to tell us all the resources and the machineries that God put together to help make this goal a reality. Are we together? That he did not just stop at giving us that standard. He went as far as by a divine election of grace, selecting a few people and dealing with them in such a unique manner so as to be able to labor to present this species, this kind of believer that will be a reflection of what the Bible calls the fullness of God in chapter 3 and in chapter 4, Paul calls it the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the first thing I told us, a quick recap, is that we are co-laborers with God. Still remember? But that there is a standard. Please listen. There is an expectation that God has and desires for every believer to attain in terms of our spiritual growth. And then for every man of God, there is an expectation in terms of those we raise. We are not given liberty to just raise people as we think. There is a standard and you are not really in ministry until you know that standard. Just because you have a sincere heart, a good sermon, and the propensity for integrity does not qualify you in truth to be a minister. A necessary requirement is that you must have that picture. How many of you know that a lecturer does not wonder what his students will become? Right from the first lecture, he already has an idea of the kind of doctor and sometimes they use images to paint the picture so that as naive and confused as that doctor in training is, he has an idea. Transformation is difficult without a reference. There has to be a reference. You cannot become like nothing. Are we together now? So the Bible says there is a standard. Every man of God in training, in building, in teaching, in pastoring, in discipling, it's important beyond learning the sermon to preach, the, the series to take, you must understand by the Spirit that as a co-laborer with Christ, I have a standard. There is a bar. Are we together now? This becomes the basis for gauging your success in ministry. Because if you do not understand God's expectation, you will be tempted to use mundane parameters. Mundane parameters. Mundane parameters. There is a standard. And the standard is called the fullness of God. Please say after me, the fullness of God. That is the standard. That means no pastor is given the liberty to rest nor unnecessarily clap for yourself until we find imprinted upon the people you are building until they can at attain in experience what the Bible calls the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. Are we together? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 19. Paul cried speaking over the Galatian church. He said, my little children of whom I travail in birth. He was speaking to people already saved. He says, again until Christ be formed. The formation of Christ. Until Christ I travail, I labor. Are we together? Regard, I will come and visit you again. You would see the passion of Paul. Even in prison, he was not bothered about his coming out. He was still writing letters to warn them that while in prison, I'm hearing that there are deviations here. Shortly, I'll be out of this place. And you believe me, I'm coming back to you to correct certain things. It seemed to me like this was the true north, the focal point of Paul's ministry. He was not as interested in fame. He was not as interested in visiting many churches. His desire, this bar, was what was before him to produce in ordinary men the fullness of God and he deployed every and all creativity whether it was letter whether it was a conference to settle their understanding whether it was training and mentorship of others the goal was to be able to produce in all believers the fullness of God who is understanding so far so that number one we are co-laborers with God many know that but um 
the challenge, especially for ministers of the gospel, is that we do not even understand the reference, the bar. So everyone is sincerely doing what he hopes to do. And so if you ask an average pastor, what exactly are you trying to produce? He tells you, I'm preaching the gospel. And he's being sincere. Or he says, I'm raising a people. And so for a long time, you would find members loyal but not becoming anything. They do not even have an idea of what they should become. Depending on who preaches, depending on who comes to the altar, or depending on the spiritual thoughts that are a trend, the people are like an amoeba. You know, you know that creature called an amoeba. They they become anything. There is no form. There's no fashion. There is no intention in building the people. The programs that constitute the sermons are largely freelance, as a result of what is in vogue per time, per season. Very dangerous. Unfortunately, you, you see, the kind and the quality of believers that are produced in any territory are a reflection of the spiritual intelligence of the leaders that built them. You literally can sample a people and use them as a report card to assess the level of understanding and the level of intelligence of the leaders that have molded them. Are we together? So we are exploring a few things and I'm saying that there is a standard. Please say there is a standard. Say it again, there is a standard. And that the standard is called the fullness of God. The fullness of God. The fullness of God. The third thing I want you to know is found in 1 Corinthians now chapter 3 where we got our text. It's a long read and please be patient. I'll start from verse 1. Verse 1, so that we'll put everything in context. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as unto spiritual, he says, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet can ye, are ye now able to bear it. He was saying, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envies and strife, listen carefully now, divisions. He says, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Verse 4, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Follow the discussion now. Who then is Paul? He says, and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Verse 6 now, I have planted, he says, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Let's stop here for a moment. Who gives increase? There is no technology invented by the wisdom of man that sustains the ability to bring increase in ministry if God does not help men. I can tell you this. And we need to be careful because in deploying all kinds of ways, whether for church growth and the rest, and I respect all of those things, some of them have been tested scientifically. Unfortunately, men are not animals. God gave them a will. And if God does not touch the heart of a man, there are times you can go to the sea like Peter. Your boat is correct. Your net is correct. The, the sea is where you will fish and yet you will not catch fish. And there is no explanation at all. It's not incompetence. There is a God factor in this business of ministry. Only the size of God. You can't use brain work. There, there is a place for principles and diligence. But I can tell you, there is a signature that only the hand of God can write. And it's important we put this at the back of our minds. Paul planted. Please, let's go back to the scripture. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God is giving someone increase. Increase in life, increase in ministry in the name of Jesus. Next verse please, very quickly. So neither then is he that planted anything, neither he that watered, but God that giveth the increase. Verse 8. Verse 8 now. Okay. Now he that planted and he that watered are one. And every man shall receive his own reward. Listen, according to his own labor. Verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. I established that already. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Verse 10. 
it says, according to the grace of God which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builded thereon. It says, but let every man take heed how he builded thereon. Verse 11. For other foundation can, can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. We'll stop at 13. Now, listen please. If any man build upon this foundation, gold. So whatever you build upon it is what determines the basis of your reward. Christ is the cornerstone. But it says there are all kinds of things that can be built on that foundation. Please leave it for us. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and then um, stubble. Let me do 13 now. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. Who is understanding so far? That a time is going to come in ministry where your work will be tried by fire and it will reveal it's, it's not something you can hide it will tell us the quality of the investment you have been making christ is the foundation of everything are we together but that the quality of what your ministry becomes please listen is whatever you add to that cornerstone that some can add gold some can add silver some can add wood some can add hay and that eventually fire will come and try the quality of what you have built are we together now so when you find out that there are people who don't seem to have longevity of impact it's not always a demonic attack it's just that there are times and seasons within the span of their work ministry where their works are tried and they would have been found wanting and let me tell you the truth it is not only satan that takes according to the parable of the talent god also collects from inefficiency and adds to efficiency it is how the economy of heaven works so verify who took what you lost so that you don't bind and cast in ignorance there are times that it is god himself for his name's sake is it not in your bible he gave unto one five he gave two he gave one he gave to all of them but what they added on what he gave was what he judged them based on this is what paul is saying that christ is that cornerstone but whatever you add on that building a day will come fire will come to test it the kind of people you have raised are we together now and i can tell you sincerely this is a pastor's conference so i'm i'm at liberty to say a few things many of us need to go back and re-examine whether the kind of work we are doing will have longevity we are celebrating 30 years i hope you know that 30 years old anything is old enough a 30 year old fool needs a miracle he doesn't need prayer he needs a miracle a complete miracle if you are 30 years and you have been working in wisdom you have gained some experience am i right on that yes longevity there is a way I wrote here, God designed that men be built. Please listen. Please listen. Please listen. Dear laborers in the gospel. There is a way that God designed that men be built. There is a way that men need to be built in order to be matured and useful vessels. This must be every minister's approach in raising men. Now listen. Listen. The degree of compliance to that model is what makes a man of God a wise master builder or otherwise. When you are called a wise master builder, it is with reference to the degree of compliance to that model. Are we together? Now, there are many estates in Lagos. And how many of you know, some of you are in real estate here, I believe, 
when you carve out an acre of land or some acres of land, you earmark them to be built. And many times, some estates insist on uniformity of buildings. Am I right? You buy the land, you are, but you are not given the liberty to build what you want. The condition is that you can buy your land, use whatever engineer, but you have to receive the architecture from the owners of the estate. So you can find five buildings looking the same, but built by different engineers. What brought the consistency of results is not the engineer, it's compliance to the architecture. That means I should see a believer in Lagos, in Kaduna, in Ghana, and the difference should not be too wide. The variety and species of believers we are raising tell the degree of compliance or deviation to that pattern. This is what God is helping us understand. Are we together? That the same way you can see a, a professor of medicine from, say, Maiduguri, meeting with a professor of medicine in Lagos, meeting with a professor of medicine in Johannesburg, they can meet for the first time and nobody would doubt one another because there was a system that standardized their practice. They literally can meet for the first time in the theater and nobody is doubting another person's proficiency. How come when you see a believer A, believer B, you are still not sure? It tells you that another kind of architecture that may not be part of the blueprint is what is being deployed. Do you understand this? It's not about being good or bad. It's about compliance to the standard. No wonder we have a lot of activities that happen weekday, week in, but we do not find that conformity to that standard called the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. Who is understanding? This is true. This is true. This is true. If I see a believer who is part of the covenant nation faithfully, genuinely connected, whether here or in the island or any other expression, even from an organizational standpoint, I expect a similarity in belief systems. Some things should not shock you. Are we together now? If it does, it becomes an embarrassment to the investment of your pastor on you. Either you are a, we call it in civil service, ghost worker. So they are there, but they are not really there. You, 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 you understand? You know what I'm talking about? There are people who are in the payroll, but they never show up. Nobody knows who they are. This has been a bother for me for a very long time. The kind and the quality of believers. And sometimes we spiritualize our architecture. It is still wrong. There is a standard. An intelligent God will not design a program and leave it to the personal creativity of people. No, there is a place for creativity. But you see, when you walk with God, creativity is not needed. It's when you are manifesting as a king that creativity becomes required. Are we together? There is a standard. There is a reference. Your call is alignment and obedience. There is, a, there is a pathway that if you pass any believer from a non-believer to a believer, there is a guarantee that that believer will have a minimum standard of excellence as far as reflecting the Christ is concerned. And I'm not just going to leave you in limbo. I want to show you the, the coordinates that the Bible calls the fullness of Christ. The fullness of God. So that you use this to benchmark the kinds of sermons. You know, sir, as God helps me in ministry and as I grow, I'm learning again that if we do not become intentional about raising people and sometimes spiritualize, you know, once someone spiritualizes an idea, no matter how wrong it is, there's no, except you're a spiritual man, it becomes difficult to judge to say, look, this thing, the person himself can be in delusion because the error came from the realm of the spirit does not make it correct. Are we together now? Yeah. There is a way God designed that men be built. You become a wise master builder to the degree to which you understand that blueprint, that architecture, and you submit yourself to it. 
as you build God's people. Remember the goal is that the fullness of God as revealed in Christ be expressed in the people. Now, it's a theological expression. In theology, we call it the reflection principle. The reflection principle is a principle by which um, you find a parallel and an image reflects an object. Are we together? You find that even in geography, the sun and the moon. How many of you know that depending on the level of the alignment of the moon, the shape it gives from the sky is not the same. There are times we call it full moon. Is that true? There are times it looks like it's almost there. In fact, many religions use that, those alignments to even decide seasons. That's how many believers are. You can see a believer barely there. And the problem is not the sun. The problem is how you found yourself there. Are we together now? Yes. The reflection principle. There are so many believers who when you look at their lives, they do not sell the idea of God in a way that the nations should desire. They are such a disturbing misrepresentation of God. And sometimes it has nothing to do with being good or bad. It is largely a product of the kind and the quality of mentorship. Listen, I want you to thank God if you are, if you are truly a member of this church. And I'm saying it not because I'm on stage here. Um, when God really wants to show you mercy, he shortens the distance between you and a teaching priest. So we have two believers here saved on the same day. But for the one, he had the opportunity to be planted in a church under a teaching priest. And for the other, it was so unfortunate, he freelanced his way. And you draw those people after five years, you will see the difference. The difference is not the Holy Spirit. No. Are we together now? The difference, I hope you know that the moment you get saved, maybe I should run this progression with you. I hope I'm not boring you. That when a non-believer becomes a believer, so this is the pathway. When an unbeliever becomes a believer, and I hope you know how that happens. There are many pastors who don't know how unbelievers become believers. It's not an impartation. Mm -mm. And it is not everything about Jesus that translates to salvation of your soul. I hope you know. Mm. There is an exact body of truth about Jesus you must believe to be saved. There are things demons believe about Jesus, but they are not saved. So, if you say you believe in Jesus, I'm still concerned. What about him do you believe? Because there is an exact information about Jesus that translates to salvation. Don't tell me you believe in Jesus. Uh -uh. Idol worshippers believe in Jesus. They believe in an idea called Jesus. There are many, many people who have Bibles, Korans, other books, and they are quite sympathetic to all of them. They don't mind opening anyone. They are, they are very comfortable with any idea that comes from them. This is a pastor's conference. Forgive me, but just allow me to drum it, huh? In the name of Jesus Christ. There is an exact information about Jesus you must believe. If not, you are not saved. There are three things in Paul's sermon. Well, I'm not dealing with that, but there are three information about Jesus that Paul gave, I mean Peter gave in the first sermon that brought 3,000 people. If you miss that information, that let it be known to you, O Israel, that the same Jesus whom you have crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. It matters what idea about Jesus you present. Are we together? Anyway, so believing in Jesus as Savior, Lord, and Christ brings you to a point where you are a believer. But the Bible tells us that being a believer is in levels. There are those that the Bible calls babes in Christ. Are we together? That maturity is not a gift in the spirit. You will never find a gift of maturity. So you are in Christ, but you are still a babe. And the Bible defines a babe as one who is bankrupt of knowledge, bankrupt of spiritual intelligence now from that point where you become a believer there are three forces that must come into your life to help your growth number one is the ministry of the holy spirit number two is the ministry of the word number three the ministry of a teaching priest if you lack any of these three already you are disadvantaged 
the ministry of the Holy Spirit guiding you in all truth the ministry of the word helping you to understand the modus operandi of the kingdom the ministry of a teaching priest like a lecturer serving you grace filtering sense from nonsense and helping you to grow when you find a believer who becomes efficient you check that person's life you will see that he was exposed to these tripartite forces even if you don't know anything about the holy spirit even if you don't know anything about the word you just be exposed to a teaching priest you see the reason why ministers will be judged because this is the the gravity of influence you literally wield that level of influence over any man's destiny there are people whose prayer for church growth god himself will not allow to be answered you know why because it is a risk to be trusted with more people he does not hate them but he needs to verify your understanding of his project do you understand what he's building you can't keep saying god give me more members why you say i love souls no no the degree to which you understand his project is the degree to which he will trust you with the people who should attain unto that so you will find sometimes very unlikely people and god seems to honor them with his presence and honor them with visibility it's not anything of themselves It's the degree to which they've paid the price with childlike faith to understand this project i can tell you that anybody who understands this maturity project that God's goal is not just to have more members God's goal is not just to have more sermons God's goal is not just to have a big church as important as that is God's goal is to be able to raise a people to bring them to a point of maturity where the least among them is able to reflect through their growth through their lives the fullness of Christ the Bible calls it the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ are we together now very quickly let's delve into this issue of the fullness of Christ what exactly is the fullness of Christ or the fullness of God it sounds like a very disturbing statement and I understand that a man can reflect the fullness of God in Isaiah chapter 40 popular scripture and verse 28 the Bible there clearly tells us that God is infinite it already says there is no searching of his understanding are we together an extent of the, the vastness of his understanding so how do you now say that an ordinary believer can reflect the fullness of christ now probably let me digress for a minute and help you you know just 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 to understand something so that it makes sense what i'm about to say now when the bible calls us partakers of god's divine nature please lend me your attention i hope you know it is not every part of god's nature he gave man no it is not every part of god's nature there are dimensions to god and in god that are exclusive to him for instance he says i am the vine you are the branches you will see a tree there but he differentiates it without hiding make no mistakes don't confuse it because they look the same i am the one who is the vine you are the branches are we together now there are three attributes of god just for your knowledge that god did not share with man and these among others are the major attributes that brand him as god in a class by himself number one is called omnipresence god did not share that with man man is not omnipresent you cannot be everywhere at the same time no matter how yielded no matter how anointed you are finite even when Jesus became a man he could not be everywhere at the same time and that was our pattern man who is learning so man even though a partaker of God's divine nature is not omnipresent number two man is not omniscient we are not all-knowing we see in part we prophesy in part are we together now that means the most yielded the most aligned we cannot know everything this is what separates us from god even though we are one number three omnipotence all powerful i have spoken once and twice have you heard that power belongs to the lord are we together now so god is all powerful but man 
is not all powerful. The power that is manifested in the believer is derived. Our dominion in this kingdom is not absolute dominion. It is derived from our relationship and depends on our relationship for its function. God does not need you. Are we together now? Yes. I wish I had the time would have dealt with the issue of authority, power, and jurisdiction. Because there are two things God gave man and it's very important for you to understand. God did not just give man power. God gave man power with authority. It is dangerous for a man to have power alone. The only person who has power alone is God. Do you know why? Because when you power is the capacity to influence things, the force that compels compliance. But authority is the legitimacy to use power. An armed robber has a gun, power. And a military man has a gun, power. But a military man has a license to shoot. That's authority. That's the reason why when an armed robber shoots his gun, he goes to jail. And then you commend a military man. But you see, the rules of authority is that there cannot be two authority except, number one, there is jurisdiction. Number two, there must be a system of supervision. It's impossible to have authority because authority is conferred by someone higher than you. The person who confers that authority automatically supervises its use. This is the reason why God as God cannot have authority. Because there is no other entity higher than him that supervises compliance. And there is no jurisdiction that restricts his power from function. Now, you understand what I'm saying and don't, don't just go and preach. You know, the challenge again we have is that when I'm having the liberty because I'm speaking to preachers, sometimes, and, and please don't feel insulted, Preachers sometimes get excited over things. They don't really understand the context. They, they think they do, and then they carry it like that and just slam it on believers who are just growing and completely scatter the pace of their growth. And at the end, the people don't even know what they're talking about again. So the, uh, the, the idea is just for our knowledge, connecting to what we're saying, not just that we run with something new uh, from this conference, and then you tell someone something, and the devil uses that shock and starts manipulating his experiences. I hope you know Satan is an opportunist. Satan uses both good and evil. Uh, any raw material that can help him thwart the purposes of God, whether it's light or darkness, he's available to use it. Go and read your Bible. you see Satan using truths many times to destroy. It's the reason why when the spirit of truth comes, even though you have truth, you must be guided if you are not guided to use truth like a knife, you can enjoy yourself with it. How did I get here? Forgive me. <laughs> let's, let's get back. Let's get back to... Okay, so we're talking about the fullness of Christ. Now, please pay attention. If, if you did not get anything that I said, I beseech you standing upon the grace of God's servant to please listen to this. When you want to study God, because of how mysterious he is, you do not have the liberty to study God except through the lens of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the most accurate portrait of the invisible God. Are we together now? The Bible calls him the express image of the invisible God. That means any other study on God without Jesus as a reference will land you in various shades of error. Are we together your, your, your most accurate study of God is through the lens of Jesus as a pattern man. Are we learning now? So we have to study Jesus to be able to filter out the various dimensions that the Bible calls the fullness of God. And very quickly, I want to show you three dimensions. These three dimensions must be captured in every believer you raise else it cannot be said they are complying with this pattern called the fullness of God. Number one, the first dimension of God that represents his fullness that he seeks to see reflected in all believers 
and that becomes a mandate for every man of God is the nature or the character of God. Please write that quickly. The nature or the character of God. In Exodus chapter 33, please give us 18 and 19. The nature or the character of God. This is the first dimension of the fullness of God as revealed in Christ that God seeks to see in every believer. Exodus chapter 33. And he said, I beseech thee, Moses, now, show me your glory. Uh -huh. And he said, I will make all my goodness, my goodness. Moses is asking for his glory. And he's saying, my goodness, it is an expression of my glory to pass before you. Hallelujah. I will make my goodness. Now, when you read Psalms 103, I've read my Bible a bit and this psalm has the most concise capture of God's character as revealed in the Bible. You literally can use Psalms 103 as a lens to study God. Most people do not understand the character of God. It is dangerous to depend on men to reveal God to you. It's not very accurate. Are we together now? The most accurate revelation of God is seen in Jesus. Then, from the lens of Jesus, you can now find supporting models that come close to that reference. So the principle of transformation is number one, looking onto Jesus. Then number two, be followers of them in that order. Looking onto Jesus, then followers of them. If you follow the them who are not following Jesus, you will become something else. These are the models of transformation. Number one, looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Then number two, following them who are looking onto Jesus. Are we learning now? So I'm saying the character of God, Psalms 103. Maybe let's look at two or three verses very quickly. Please give it to us, media. Psalms 103, very powerful. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, verse 2. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefit. Then it begins to list five of them. Who forgives your sins, who heals your diseases, you know, who redeem it, thy, thy life. This is a description of who God is. So that if you do not know God and you've never met him, you do not know him. You literally can use his nature to identify him and separate him from other gods. It is possible that I want to meet a gentleman I have never met. You can use that person's nature and character to help me identify that person. You will say, enter this room, you will see a gentleman, he doesn't really talk loud, he will most likely be a respectful fellow. When I will use the lens of your description and with prophetic accuracy, without being a prophet, I can say you are most likely the person who I was sent to. So you can use the nature of God to decipher between him and every other entity. Most people do not know God because they do not know his nature. And in order of priority, the first dimension of God he wants to see in believers is his nature, his character. The Bible says in John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, just right for reference, 7 to 12, he says God is love. This is profound. I can spend all day talking about this. He says, beloved, let us love one another. It says, for love is of God and everyone that loveth, please listen, is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8. He that loveth not, ah, knoweth not God. Even if he's talking about him, God is saying you do not know me. It is impossible to love me. Are we all to claim to know me without loving me and loving your brother? He says for God is love. Everybody please say God is love. So the Bible tells us in one word that the very nature of God is love. That means God uses love as the ultimate index to measure maturity, not enlightenment. In the economy of God, when he comes to measure your extent of spiritual maturity, he does not search for revelation. Uh -uh. That is very 
secondary. He looks for how much the love of God has been furnished within your heart. And the proof is not your love towards him. The proof is your love towards your brother. That if you cannot love your brother who you can see, it's impossible to claim who is learning now so the love life of a believer is proof that the nature of god is at work in you these are exact references they are not given you are not given the liberty for argument the love of god when the bible says the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace in truth the fruit of the spirit is love and then its various expressions is what you find as joy, peace, and so on and so forth. That is the outworkings of the nature of God within the recreated human spirit. Are we learning now? So the first dimension of the fullness of God that we must see to it that is reflected in everyone under our care is the nature of God, the character of God. The nature of God, the character of God. The Bible says the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and rich in love. If you are going to reflect the Christ like him, you must also be gracious and compassionate regardless your background, regardless your temperament. That's why the Holy Ghost came. He came as an equalizer to terrible temperaments. Are we together now? So once you get born again, your excuse of foundation is over. You cannot say it's, it's because of the way I was raised. Now, I understand that and I respect it, but the moment you get born again, you have entered into a system that can wield a force upon your limitations and still make you Christ-like. Who is learning? The nature of Christ. Let me hurry up for sake of time. Number two. The second dimension that represents the fullness of God as seen in Christ is called the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. That means in building man, this is the architecture that you labor to see to it that number one, the nature and the character of God as revealed in Christ is fashioned within them. Then number two, the wisdom of Christ. What the Bible calls the ways of God psalms 103 and verse 7 the ways of god now this is important and the other matters he made known his ways unto moses his acts to the children of israel the bible says in matthew chapter 13 and verse 11 jesus was speaking he said it has been given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom the wisdom of god now as important as the nature of christ is if you stop there, you will produce a lopsided people. You have to, in addition to planting within them the nature of Christ, they must manifest the wisdom of Christ. Because it is through wisdom a house is built, not through character. Character is wonderful, but it is through wisdom. There are believers who have the nature of Christ, but you see the deficiency of the wisdom of Christ, and they do not attain that stature called the fullness of Christ. Who is learning? The wisdom of Christ. Teaching after teaching. Submitting yourself to the ministry of the teaching priest. It does something to your spiritual understanding. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It is superior belief that brings superior experiences. Your experiences will be a reflection of your belief systems. In fact, I say it this way, that your belief system is your contribution to your failure or your success. Your belief system is your own contribution to your failure or your success. The nature or the character of Christ. Number two, the wisdom of Christ. Number three, finally, is called the power of God or the works of Christ. You see, there is something called the power of God. The power of God. Matthew 22 from verse 29, the B part, the power of God. Please give it to us. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He wants you to know both. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, when you read from verse 18 and 19, 
Paul was praying over the church in Ephesus and he lets us know, he lets us into the content of his prayer and he says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. Let's read verse 19 together. And the exceeding greatness, he wants you to know, you can know the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe and you can walk in that reality. Ladies and gentlemen, the nature of God as revealed in Christ plus the wisdom of God as revealed in Christ plus the power of God as revealed through the works of Christ equals the fullness of Christ. Now hear me. Every time you find a lopsided believer, you will trace it to the deficiency in the patterns here. So we have various versions of believers and you can explain that variation from the degree of compliance of these patterns or otherwise. Number one, you can have a believer who has been mentored well to understand the implication of opening themselves to have the nature of Christ. Moral excellence, holiness, righteousness. But that person can be broke, mediocre, defeated and you'll be wondering why how can somebody who has such integrity and such character be defeated in life usually we blame it on God but God is saying it is a deviation there is a standard that if this gentleman followed through mentorship so the gent he will never bribe no he will not be corrupt he would rather pay the price and yet the gentleman believes that just because he has the nature of Christ, he has the fullness of Christ. And he desires results that only wisdom and power can give. And it becomes dangerous if you are now deceived and beguiled to ignore other dimensions. Then number two, we have those who have ignored this, the nature of Christ and they have pressed through sound teachings, communication of doctrine, the principles of the kingdom and the laws that govern the universe. They have accessed the wisdom of Christ. They, they are system builders. They run businesses. They have a lot of things. They are prosperous, but they do not have character. They will compromise at every given opportunity. And sometimes you wonder, how can you be so full of light and darkness at the same time it depends on how you were trained are you seeing that now it doesn't matter they are smart they can get the contract but they can cut corners and it does not matter and then number three you have those who can prophesy can manifest the gifts of the spirit are we together can heal any sick body but oh dear you sit down under that atmosphere you will be lean and hungry till you die even in the presence of the anointing because all you will receive is you will be healed and yet not be transformed you will receive all kinds of prophetic word until in all sincerity you become confused because your whole life you can't walk in authority and confidence the side effect of gifts alone is that you will have fear because they open you up to the realm of the spirit beyond your level of transformation and you live your entire life i'm going to travel tell me will i die or will i live you the authority becomes useless to you because you have become a slave to gifts is someone learning now now let me tell you this no single man of God as a ministry is given the liberty to bring any believers to this threefold dimension alone no matter how yielded I'm wrapping up now I want to show you where the challenge most times in the body of Christ is so if there are people who by reason of their alignment and their election this is the area of stay to help the body of Christ become a people fashioned after God in character, righteousness, and holiness. And the bias of your training is such that God trains you in such a way that you excel where he, have he has called you. And that excelling can beguile you to imagine that any other dimension outside of your space is not useful. But you will see the deficiency of your not embracing other dimensions. So, the man can say, I, I would die poor. Let my children eat grass. I will stand on my, um, what they call it now, on my integrity. I agree. 
but that person produces a disaster. And if someone is to learn God through the lens of such a life, he will say God must be a wicked God because based on that, he does not reward holiness. And yet it's because he's not wholesome in that expression. Then you have someone who is wise. I mean, anything he touches becomes gold. He can tell you the principles of anything. He knows the principles of influence, the principles of leadership, the law of honor. The Bible says, knowest thou the ordinances of heaven and canst thou establish the dominion thereof upon the earth. This is the assignment of wisdom. Wisdom is connected to mighty works. And because of the excellency of that dimension, you will find out that sometimes you can ignore the nature of Christ or ignore the power of Christ. For such people, the Bible says, ever learning, but never coming unto the knowledge of the truth. Because there is a grace dimension that makes what you have heard become profitable. Are we together? And for most, unfortunately and with all due respect, especially the apostolic and the prophetic, this is where there's been a very big mistake. You can be carried away by the abundance of the demonstration of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And because signs and wonders are very compelling in the world of men. If someone rises up, up, on, up you know, you are speaking now, someone stands up from a wheelchair. It's too spectacular to ignore. And chances are excellent that, how do you now tell me I don't know what I'm saying? But it's possible I don't know what I'm saying. You see that now? So a lot of miracles have made many bad things to remain. Because when error seems to be endorsed by a miracle, it's just the mercy of God for the sake of those who have come to receive. It's not necessarily endorsing that limitation of the vessel. God will not, because of the carelessness or the lack of growth of one man of God, ignore the hunger and the prayer and the fasting of someone. There are many miracles that happen in a meeting, I tell you sincerely, that have, has nothing to do with the man who is there. It's just that we claim credit because you were the one holding the mic at that point. But the truth is that that man had been praying and he had gotten to the fullness of time that coincided with your preaching. So it may not necessarily be now, don't get me wrong. There should be a performance to the things that you say. But it is not always an endorsement. But chances are excellent that in the presence of such spectacular manifestation, we take credit for it to mean God is endorsing even our limitations and our ignorance. And so we stop being students in the school of the Spirit. And people begin to follow after that error. Their search is for the miraculous and not for growth. A wise master builder if you are to bring the formation of the Christ in his fullness it is going to be the nature of Christ plus the wisdom of Christ plus the power of Christ this is the portrait of God the portrait of Jesus that every church must contend for now if you do not have the grace to make all these three possible it is your responsibility to true humility and discernment outsource other graces that can complement and supplement for that deficiency are we together now yes. we're going to pray many of us here are ministers of the gospel the lord just answered your question as to why there are many poor people in your church even though they are holy i can tell you don't feel embarrassed it is because the wisdom of christ is deficient with the intelligence of a consultant you can diagnose the spiritual state of those under your care and know what dimension of god is deficient and know how to bring it like a doctor says oh you lack vitamin d you lack vitamin e take this supplement for two months and you find out that the pain that came as a result of lack of vitamin D because you are taking it. For some of you, you came for this meeting and God is telling you, go back and work on your own character and the character of those under your care. There is a gross deficiency of the reflection of this dimension of God's glory. For many, I presume, with all due respect, the deficiency is in the area of wisdom. You see, wisdom, wisdom. 
the stuntedness, the absence of longevity in our impact is the bankruptcy of wisdom. The ups and downs are a testament that wisdom is missing. It's an uncomfortable truth, but it's true. And then for many, we still lack the power. And I'm not just talking of falling down and standing up. I'm talking about the spiritual investment upon you. The wherewithal to bring performance to your speakings. Because the assignment of the anointing is to bring validation to the speakings of God. If the word of God does not proceed, the anointing does not have any assignment. The assignment of the word of God is to bring validation, to insist that God did not lie. So if you have the truth and you do not have the power that backs the truth, the truth will soon look like a lie. Are we together? Jesus, as the word said, he would die and rise again after three days. That was the truth. But it took power to raise him. That same power. It didn't take truth again. Truth made the statement. Power defended the statement. So you can teach the truth but you need the power that backs that truth upon your people so it stops it from being a lecture you tell people god is the lifter and teach them the principles the law of honor the law of relationships but whilst you are teaching you are aware that there is an invisible transaction there is an impartation happening someone is saying wow i'm learning the law of honor then the, en the enabling power of the spirit is resting upon them do you know that to obey the truth requires grace? There is something called the doing grace. It says, now that ye know these things, happy are you when you do them. They heard the word just like we did. They didn't hear a lie, but they could not perform it. It says, son of man, stand up upon your feet. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 1. He didn't have the power to stand. He heard the truth, but the grace to stand was not there. Then it says, the spirit entered me. The spirit entered me. There is an engracing, and this is the dimension. And the dynamics for walking in these dimensions are different. Maybe one day God will give us grace to discuss them. How you build the nature of Christ is different from how you build the wisdom of Christ. It's different from how you build the power of Christ. So don't tell me you are doing spiritual exercises. For which goal? Which one are you doing? Prayer and fasting is wonderful and it helps, but it does not get all of these things at once. No, it's an uncomfortable truth, but the hell oh dear. I tell you with all humility, you believe me on this. There are people who want the nature of Christ. There are the spiritual dynamics that builds within you the nature of Christ is there are variations when you want to contend for the wisdom of christ you see you can build the nature of christ alone through consecration through prayer through repentance you can't build wisdom alone you need to be taught it says how can i understand except some man teach me are we together you can stay alone and cry in repentance pour out your heart you don't need anybody when it has to do with building the nature of Christ. Your secret place is your real secret. But when it has to do with building wisdom, the house of God, when I came to the house of God, then understood I, the ministry of the teaching priest, methodically helping you line upon line, precept upon precept. I have to wrap up. Who has learned something? A wise master builder is the one who number one realizes that I am a co-laborer with God in any in any dimension at all ministry business leadership number two a wise master builder understands that there is a standard the Bible calls it the fullness of God the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ so that when you go back to your various churches, as you stand on the pulpit, you are not looking at congregants. You are looking at people who have been trusted. God gave them to you as a trust and you must account for them. 
John 17, all that you have given me I have kept and none is lost except the son of perdition and that that scripture might be fulfilled. Do you know Jesus had to account for Judas? He had to explain why Judas fell and he said, look, he's a son of perdition. There is a prophecy that I'll be betrayed. Unfortunately, he partnered with that word. That's how he landed there. God had to, had to explain that. For many of us here, listen to me. I'm wrapping up. Now you see that you'll be careful when you are crying for increase. Lord, what you gave Pastor Poju, it must come in this conference. And God is saying, hold on. I don't have a problem bringing increase. But it becomes a risk. You become another kind of error that will be sold. And until it, you see the thing about error is that it travels almost at the same rate as truth. So until it damages a lot of people because it takes a lot of courage to stop error the person who becomes the one anointed to stop error must be prepared to be wounded with many blows you have to be wounded huh? it is once you are wounded then people eventually see that oh this is true but for the time being and not many people have that courage to stand the way of error until it stops so it continues sometimes transgenerationally I wish we had the time would have spoken about a man in the Bible called Balaam would have followed the progression of how that guy got into a disaster are we together yeah. it started from the error of Balaam it was an error then eventually it became a way of Balaam by the time we get to revelation it had become the doctrine of Balaam God told you, buy only three cars. That's his unique dealing. Your obedience produced great results and you mentored people after that and it started becoming a way. All the people who come from you and for someone, his assignment demands 10 cars because you'll be giving a lot of them. You now made his assignment stunted in honor to what you call revelation until eventually, because of the excellency of your obedience, it now becomes a doctrine. Are we together we're going to be praying we are celebrating a man today and I say this in all sincerity 30 years of consistency 30 years of grace only God knows the giants that have been brought down the walls that have been pushed the troops that have been pushed through and we're not just here to celebrate but we're here to learn and to inspire ourselves if you see the covenant nation standing, then I believe that it is because God has brought longevity to this ministry in honor to its degree of compliance to this pattern. The lesson is that all of us must examine ourselves first in light of this. To what degree can you say the character of the Christ has been formed in you? And when it has to do with this thing of character but there are no generals there let me tell you up front there are generals in revelation there are signs and wonders generals but when it has to do with the nature of christ it must become our consistent pursuit per day to become more like him to become more like him paul said that i may know him paul cried desiring his conformity as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ at the zenith of his apostolic ministry, Paul opened up his frustration, battling the flesh and the spirit. And he said, listen, let me tell you a true confession. I serve the Lord with my spirit, but he says, within my body I find another law walking within my members, such that the things I want to do, I do not find myself doing them. And the things that I do not want to do, I find myself doing them. Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The one who casted out demons is crying for help and mercy. So when it has to do with this issue of character, godliness, moral excellence, I can, I, if we give Pastor Poju the mic to come and help us, I am sure he will tell us stories. There are people who scattered their testimony at their 29th year. So you can't be too old to fall. When it has to do with the issue of character, we must learn to hold on to the four horns of the altar 
obtaining mercy by God. And out of the abundance of that mercy we have received, we communicate same to those who are under our care. Who's understood me so far? It's true. And then the wisdom of Christ. Don't come here and just be admired uh, and admire all the things that God has done through the man of God. Learn. Everything you see that makes this ministry work is a product of wisdom. Wisdom is connected to mighty works. Learn. What do I need to add to my church or my organization? I don't understand people's skills. I need to go and get a book. Don't say it's unnecessary because you are praying. The Bible says, add to this, this. Add to this, this. Add to this, this. It says, if you do that, you will be entire, lacking nothing. And then, for the power of God. We have other sessions, and I trust that within the course of this conference, God will expose us to the truths that will build afresh in everyone again, this threefold dimension. Is it all right to say a word of prayer? Let's rise up on our feet. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace that our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger. Just one prayer point. Father, I obtain grace. I obtain mercy. Someone cry. Celebrating 30 years of your faithfulness over this church, over this ministry, over God's servant in ministry. Go ahead and obtain grace. The doing grace. The keeping grace. Someone go ahead and pray that by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that God will walk upon you to deepen your consecration walk upon you to cry like never before to have the nature of christ manifested in you in experience the love life the character of the christ mercy compassion love for god and for one another and for the people that you lead for someone you are crying for wisdom it's time to step up to a level of wisdom wisdom that works wisdom that works not ignorance laced with pride wisdom that works and then for someone you are crying for the power of god because you are entering a season of performance mary said how shall these things be seeing that i know not a man there are many projects that some of us have it needs the power of god take a minute to pray and let it be from the depth of your heart